Today, I'm going to teach you how to count nine rhythm patterns beginners always struggle to count correctly. And specifically, I'm going to teach you how to count tremolos, grace notes, triplets of all varieties, mordants, trills, and pickups. First up is the tremolo. And a tremolo is when you alternate between two notes rapidly, and most of the time they are about an octave apart. And it creates a type of effect. You need to have your pedal down at the same time. And it's usually used at the end of a piece. Now, one thing that throws a lot of students off is that you have a half note here and another half note on the other half of the tremolo. And a lot of students are gonna think Oh, there's a half note, which you may know gets played for two beats, one, two, and then there's a half note here, one, two. So it's probably going to take up four beats, right? Well, not quite. Here's how it works. The way I would think about this is that this is a half note tremolo. Don't count them both, just one. So when you're doing this, alternating between the octaves, of course, with the pedal down, you are doing it for the value of just a half note, one two and then whatever the next note may be or maybe it'll be at the end of a song one two done you can also have tremolos between different note values like whole notes now this is a whole note and if you may know a whole note counts for four one two three four and this is a whole note so you're gonna play it for eight beats right no remember it's only one two three four and then on to the next measure next up we have grace notes and a grace note is known as an, a type of ornament, meaning that it adds something to the notes that are there, uh, kind of like you put ornaments on a Christmas tree to make it look a bit more interesting. So here we have four quarter notes, each with a grace note on each. And if you know, a quarter note just gets one beat and we're in four, four. So normally you'd count it one, two, three, four. Now here's what trips up a lot of students. They think that this note right here, the grace note, which is the smaller note right here, they think that that hits on each of the beats like this. One, two, three, four. That is incorrect. Remember, each of these beats, that's where the primary note is. And we're gonna call that primary note or a principal note. And you're gonna hear me use those interchangeably throughout the lesson. Here is a key rule. The principal note, it doesn't matter what type of ornament you have. I'm trying to think if there are any exceptions. I don't think so. Remember this, very important. Are you listening? The primary beat or the principal note always hits on the beat. So it's going to sound more like this. One, two, three, four. With each of the four beats hitting on that E, sneaking in the D sharp right there, right before. It's almost like you hit the wrong note by accident, but you just got to make sure that you're hitting the principal note on the beat. So I wanted to play a real example for you with a grace note. And here we have Minuet in G by Petzold. And it is the second line here. And look, we have a grace note. So I'll show you what this is gonna sound like in context. Next up is the Mordant, which looks like a funny little scribble and there is a purpose to this this is another type of ornament which does what do you think hmm let's see does it make the notes louder no remember an ornament just like an ornament on a christmas tree or ornament out on your lawn is kind of like a little decoration that you put on the notes that are already there to make them more interesting and this ornament in particular can be quite tricky as you can see we actually have another type of mordant here we'll talk about in a second but here's how a mordant works. So here we have four Gs in this measure. And remember that you have to play the primary note right on the beat. And this ornament goes like this. You play the primary note, or also called the principal note. You play the next scale note above that note. So if you're in the key of C, the next scale note after G is A. So you're gonna go G, A, and then back to the principal note. And you're going to hit that last note, which is the principal note. So these are the ornaments, and that's the principal note. You're going to hit that principal note on the first beat. One, like that, one, one. It's not gonna go like this, one. That's too late, one. 
Remember, it's like you accidentally hit some wrong notes right before you're supposed to come in. One, two, three, four, just like that. This is an inverted mordant. Can you guess what it does? It's the exact opposite. You play the principal note that's written, you play the note scale note below, and then back to that. And remember, it's the scale note. I know it can be a little confusing, but keep in mind that it's just uh, like this, where you are hitting G, the note below F, and then remember, you're hitting that final G, the principal note, right on beat one. So it's gonna be one, two, three, four. And I want to play for you an example of a mordant or an inverted mordant in the same piece we were looking at before, that minuet in G. So here's the minuet in G starting from the first line. As you can see, we have two inverted mordants here. And I'm just going to play it first, and I'm going to talk about how I approach each one. This one in particular does get me sometimes, the one in the middle there. Uh, but let's just give it a playthrough and see what happens. Now, I wanna talk about this measure right here, where you have the C in your left hand, E in the right hand, and then you have this inverted mordant right on the beginning of a pair of eighth notes, or I guess four eighth notes right in a row. So it can be kind of tricky. Here's how I'm gonna count that, right? So we are in three, four, and there's this thing called subdivision. So if you have each of your three beats, one, two, three, you can split them in half as one and two and three and. Well, in this particular measure, we have eighth notes, so I'm counting it as this. I'm not gonna play the mordant first. It's gonna be kind of like this. One and two and three and, and then one, two, three on the next measure. Now, here's the thing. You're gonna count one and for the E, and then remember, you have to finish the whole inverted mordant and get back to that C by you, the time you say two. So it's gonna be one and two. And that's how I would start tr um, playing this. One and two and three and. And once you get those first two beats down, the rest of it is super easy. But you just wanna make sure you're being careful with counting because sometimes I don't count and it still gets me even on this piece that's a bit easier for me. So that's how you do it. Next up is the fermata, which looks like a funny looking eye or something. And this one is actually pretty easy, but it does confuse a lot of students. So the whole idea of a fermata right here <laughs> is that you're going to be holding that note longer than its intended value. Now, what is its intended value? Well, a quarter note. That's what note is written there. So normally you would count this as one, two, three, four. Pretty simple, right? Now with the fermata, it's counted one, two, three, four. And you just kind of like give it a, a pause there before you continue, assuming that there's more notes at the end. Sometimes there's a fermata right on the last note and you'll just hold that note, you know, for a while until it trails off. Now, here's the thing. Fermatas don't tell you how long you're supposed to hold the note, right? It's just longer than its intended value. And you may be like, well, how long is too long? How long do I hold it? And it may depend a little bit on the context. And let me give you two examples. One is happy birthday. And then the other one is Toccata in D minor, quite different examples, but you're gonna see what I mean here. So here we have happy birthday. And as you know, or may not know, that happy birthday has a fermata in it and it works perfectly with the song that we know. Now this is the happy birthday song in the States. I think there are different places that have different ones, uh, but I will try my best to sing it along for you so that you know where that fermata comes in. I'll, tell, I'll give you a hint. It's right when you say the person's name, like Timothy, happy birthday to you. So here's the whole thing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Timothy. Happy birthday to you. And if you're familiar with that song, you all know how long to hold that note. You know, Emily, happy birthday to you. So that's how long you would hold it in happy birthday. But let me show you Toccata in D minor because it might be a little bit different. Here we have the Toccata and Fugue in D minor. And you can see in a few places right on the first line, we have several fermatas you know, over rests and over certain notes. 
And you may be wondering, how long are we going to hold these for since they only tell us to hold it longer than its intended value? Well, if you know this piece, it kind of moves along and you don't have a lot of time to hold on the fermatas because if you did, It's kind of going to ruin the flow of the notes, right? If you held it as long as you do for happy birthday, or, or sorry, dear somebody, <laughs> happy birthday to you. So in this case, you're just going to hold them a little bit longer than their intended value. So the point I'm making is that the fermata, how long you're going to hold it depends on the context. Think about the song and the way it's usually played, or maybe even listen to a professional recording of the song, and that may give you a clue on how long to hold the fermatas. There's no real science behind fermatas, but remember, it always depends on the context of the song, and sometimes a long fermata is right what you like, pretty much what you want, and sometimes a long fermata doesn't really fit the piece in the case of this. Right? It's like, oh, what's happening? What's next? So always use your brain and remember the context matters. As I promised in the beginning, next up we're going to be doing triplets of all varieties. We're going to be talking about eighth note triplets, quarter note triplets, and sixteenth note triplets, since these seem to trip up students all the time. Let's start with eighth note triplets, and actually I even want to take a step back and talk a little bit about subdivision, which I mentioned earlier. So we're taking a look at this measure here where we have four groups of triplets. And you remember before when I was talking about subdivision, I was saying that like we have four quarter notes normally just counted as one, two, three, four. Now we are splitting them into eighth notes, one and two and three and four and, where you have each of the first eighth notes hitting on a number and then the second half hitting on what we call and, which just looks like a plus sign. And I wanted to bring that up because triplets is a very similar concept to eighth notes. It's subdivision, but this time you're doing it in thirds. And we subdivide into three using this term. This is what I like to use. Some people use something different, but I like to say the number, the first note on the triplet is the number, so one. The second note, I say tri, and then the last note I say plet. So one triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet, just like that. And that's all there really is to counting eighth note triplets. Now, what if you have a quarter note triplet? This trips up people all the time. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. An eighth note triplet. Actually, let's take a look back here, okay? An eighth note triplet, there's four of them, right? And remember, three in each beat. So each of these eighth note triplets actually takes up the value of one quarter note, right? We have beats one, two, three right here, and then four on that last grouping here. Now, if an eighth note triplet takes up the value of a quarter note, which is one note value above an eighth note, right? Eighth notes get half a beat, quarter notes get a whole beat. Now, think about it for a second. A quarter note triplet gets the value of what? It gets the value of a half note. It gets the value of whatever note value is above a quarter note, which is a half note for two beats. Now, how do you count two beats of triplets? Well, here's the easy way to do it. You're actually going to combine two groups of eighth note triplets, right? One triplet, two triplet, except what you're gonna do is this. You are going to assign two of the syllables for each of these notes. So here's how this is gonna work. This is gonna get up, this is gonna take up one tri. This one's gonna take up plet, since that was our last group in the first group of one triplet. So one triplet. This is gonna take up two as well. So this takes up one tri, plet two, and guess what? This gets triplet. So each of these actually gets two in each of those groupings. And then once you're here, you're kind of in the clear with three and then four. And here's how you're gonna count it. One triplet, two triplet. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you practice it a bunch, Trust me that it gets quite a lot easier. Now we have a 16th note triplet, which can seem really scary and daunting, 
But I just want to take a look at this first grouping of notes here, the three triplets and then that last eighth note there. Now, I want you to think about it like this. Remember, three eighth note triplets takes up the value of one quarter note. Three quarter note triplets takes up the note the value of a half note. <laughs> that one with the circle. You know what a half note is. And then think about it. This is three sixteenth note triplets. So it's actually going to take up the value of only an eighth note this time. Now, let me show you exactly how this is counted. Okay, so here we have this pattern again, except I made these eighth notes to make a point, right? Remember, eighth notes are counted one and two and three and. So let me write out the last three beats of this measure. Now I want you to keep in mind that each of these syllables, two and three and four and, each of those by themselves, the number and then the and are each an individual eighth note, right? So that's one eighth note, that's two. Now keep that in mind because that's very important to understanding this. Let's take a look at this one more time. So we have three 16th note triplets and then an eighth note. So I just said that a 16th note triplet is worth one half of a beat, right? And I just said that each of these are also equal the value of an eighth note, which is one half of a beat. So therefore this is counted one and two and three and four and now, how do you play it correctly? Well, it's pretty easy. So do uh, this is what I want you to do first. Just play straight eighth notes. One and two and three and four and. Now what I want you to do is subdivide those eighth notes into three parts on each. So um, three parts, three parts, three parts, three parts like this. One and two and three and four and. And I just counted the whole thing in 16th note triplets. So in this case, we only have one set of 16th note triplets and then we just have the and right here. So it's gonna be counted like this. One and, two and, three and, four and. And it makes it so much easier once you understand that a 16th note triplet is just taking up the value of one of those eighth notes. So instead of going one and, it's one and. So one, two, three, do, 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 just like that. Next up are staccatos. And these may seem really easy, but trust me, a lot of students really struggle playing these correctly. So here we have four quarter notes, right? One, two, three, four. And a staccato, these little dots below the notes, tell us to hit those notes short. One, two, three, four. And a lot of students think, wait, I'm playing faster, right? If I'm playing staccato, because I'm coming off the note faster, right? So I'm moving on to the next note faster. No, it does not work like that. So it's just, well, it's similar to the mordants and some of those ornaments we were talking about, where they have to hit on the beat, right? The primary notes. And I would think about it like this. These are still the primary notes, right? We don't have any grace notes or anything next to them, but it's still one, two, three, four. It's really that it, you're not shortening the notes value at all. You are simply just coming off the note faster, creating a, like kind of a detached sound between each of the notes. So normally, see how like one note doesn't stop like right until the other one begins? Well, the staccato, one, two, three, four, you just have that space in between. You're still counting those four beats the exact same as you would normally. Now, you may be saying, well, what about tenudos? Or maybe you didn't know what a tenudo is because you know a tenudo is kind of interesting because I'll tell you what it does. Um, so here we have four beats and a tenudo tells you it's the opposite of a staccato. It tells you to hold the notes for the complete value. One, two, three, four. And you may think like, well, what's the difference between a, playing a tenudo and playing the note normally not much. That's, in my opinion, that's why you don't see tenudos too often. A lot of times when you see tenudos, it's when you have a bunch of staccato notes and the composer wants you to tell you, hey, we're not playing these staccato anymore. You want to make sure that you are holding them for the correct amount or, or not putting any uh, space in between the notes. They are counted the exact same though. One, two, three, four. There's just not that um, gap between each of the notes. 
Okay, trills are up next. And this one actually is confusing for a lot of students, just because uh, a lot of people are confused on how to play them properly. And some people actually have different opinions on how they're played, but this is the way I was taught. This is um, true for classical music and romantic music, your box, your Beethovens, and so forth. So what you do this time is you're actually not starting on the principal note. The principal note is the large note. And the ornament is the small note. Sometimes it's in parentheses. Sometimes with you saw with the um, grace note, it's like a little note they sneak in right before. This one has a little note after. It says TR and then a little scribble line. And the scribble line is usually like how long you're playing the trill for. So I'm going to teach you how to play a trill and how long to play it for, which is really what we're focusing on today. So here's how a trill works. You are going to alternate between the note above the principal note. It has to be the scale note. So we're in the key of C, it's just the very next white key there. So we're going to hit F first and alternate between F and E. And you gotta have the pedal down, the sustain pedal for this to work. And I like to use fingers one and three. You may see people do three and two. And that's, that's decent for beginners if you've never played um, a trill before, but you actually get a little bit more hand strength between here, um, this muscle, and the third finger than you do between these two, where the muscles are a little bit weak. You won't have as much control doing that. Now, that's what a trill is. The question is, how long do you play the trill for? Well, did you, have you guessed what it is? Remember what I've said the entire lesson. Remember, I even gave you a hint, like, really early on in the lesson. You play the ornament for the value of the primary note. So remember um, with the tremolos in the beginning, even though there was two half notes, you're only playing it for the value of that half note. Well, trills, especially in this case, we're only gonna be trilling for one beat. One, two, three, four. And, and as soon as you get off a of beat one, one, two, you have to be able to hit that next note right there. So you don't really have long the trill here. And in a lot of cases, trills can be a bit longer. There can be a trill over two beats, over four beats, or multiple measures even. So here we have Sonata 16 in C major. Everybody knows this one. Or better yet, uh, K545 by Mozart. Once I play it, you're definitely going to know what piece it is. So we do have a trill here on the second line in the first measure. And the real question is, how long do you get to hold or play this trill for where the TR is. Well, remember what I said. What did I say? It's the value of the principal note or the primary note. And, and how long is that primary note in this case? It gets the value of an eighth note. So we really only have half of a beat here to play that trill. It's going to be real short. But ba -da -da, ba -da -da. Now, <laughs> you probably want me to play the piece and play it in context, which I will. And trust me, you will recognize this piece right away if you don't already know what K545 is. Are you ready? Next up is the glissando, which I kind of showed you in the intro a little bit. Now, this one's confusing, huh? Because you have a half note here and a half note here. Well, do you remember what I said with the tremolos, how you're not gonna add them together? Well, that's not really true here. Uh, you're going to be playing this for a total of four beats. However, however, the half note, and I, I guess I should explain what the glissando is here in a second. But anyway, you're hitting this half note and you have two beats to play the glissando up to that note, and then you're gonna hold that for two beats. So two beats, two beats and it's actually going to sound more like this so a glissando is this and it's a special thing to do on the piano because a trombone well first of all glissando is a, a sliding of the notes think about a trombone that's my trombone uh impression <laughs> that is a glissando trombones are especially great because they have that slide there pianos don't have a slide though and this is how you want to approach a glissando now you have to be very careful because you can actually hurt your fingers doing this. In fact, you probably will hurt your fingers at first. But here's what you do, is you karate chop the note <laughs> you're starting on. You don't have to, you don't actually have to hit it like that, but just rest your hand there. And then I want you to tilt your hand up like this um, so that your fingertips are like pointing 
down towards the earth. Not not completely, but but like kind of at an angle that way, okay? Because the whole goal of a glissando, especially on piano, is to use your nails to shield your fingers from getting caught between all of these notes. Because if you just slide your finger, right, you really feel it rubbing there, and you may even catch your finger and damage it. I saw somebody, uh, like, bleed all over the piano one time. That's it. We're not going to get into that story right now, but I'm just saying be careful when you're doing this. And the key is to get your fingernails to hopefully shield your hands. I still mess it up sometimes, but here's how you count it, okay? So remember what I said. You're hitting this F here, and this note is an F two octaves above, by the way, the second note. You have two beats to play this glissando and then you're gonna hit that on beats three because we're in four four. So one, one, two, three, four, just like that. It's a little trial and error. One, two, three, four to hit that right on beat three and hit rate four. But that's how you are going to play it. It's really just like that. And there are of course different glissandos over different note values, quarter notes, whole notes, things like that. Here's a little example for you that kind of combines a trill. So we're going to play this trill for how long in the bass B flat clarinet there? For two beats, right? Because it's a half note. So one, two, of course with the pedal, one, two. And then here is a glissando. I wanted to make a point about this. Sometimes a glissando will look the way I said, which has like a, a scribble between two notes or a line between two notes. Sometimes it'll just have a note and then another note and a, a straight line that says gliss. And that stands for glissando. Sometimes they will actually write out all the notes they want you to hit um, like this and have a, um, a slur line underneath it. So here's how this one's played, right? We're in 4-4, four, four, so we have one, two, and then I have two beats to hit the glissando. Three, four, <laughs> like that. It takes a little practice. One, two, three, four. Oops, I missed it. <laughs> one, one, two, three three, four. Close enough. I, I keep practicing it, but I think you get the idea. You have two beats on the trill and then two beats to get that glissando. So we only have two things left in this lesson. One final rhythm pattern, and then we actually have a bonus tip at the very end that kind of ties everything we are learning together. But before that, I just want to say a quick thank you to all those that have supported the channel over the years, from the regular viewers, to the channel members, to the mods, to people that sign up for courses over on my website, pianolessonsontheweb.com. Without your help, we wouldn't have been able to reach as many people as we've had. The final one is the pickup, and it's another one that's pretty easy to understand. However, I know that you're playing this wrong, and you're like, how would you know that, Tim? I know that a pickup measure is an incomplete measure where you play um, basically a beat before you come in. So if we're in 3-4, and this is a pickup measure, see how it's kind of it just has one note and it's lonesome right there? And you know that that's not correct because we need three beats in each measure. Well, this is a pickup measure meaning that the last beat, beat three, is this first note. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, like that. Now you are still playing this wrong, even if you know how to count it right. Three, one. Now what am I talking about? Well, I am talking about this. Music has what we call natural accents on it. And an accent is a note played with more emphasis. So in a measure of four, four, there are two accents. There's an accent on beat one, one, and there's an accent on beat three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. With the accent on beat one being the strongest one. In three, four, there's only one accent. It's a strong accent on beat one. So it's gonna be counted one, two, three. One, two, three. Now it doesn't need to be quite that forceful, but when you're playing, you wanna put a natural accent on the first grouping of each of those groups of threes or the beginning of each measure to give the music a, um, a moving along type of feeling. And it's just gonna sound just a little bit better when you do that. So let me show you first what it's like not putting an accent in on beat one. And then I'm gonna show you what it's like putting the accent on. So remember I'm coming in on beat three, so it's gonna go one, two, three, one, two.
So I'm going to try the same thing, except I'm going to put an accent on beat one. So it's going to go one, two, three. And like I said, it's a subtle difference, but you could hear a difference, right? Ba, 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 da, da. And that's actually how you would sing it if you were singing this piece. So it's just most important to know though that with a pickup measure, it's an incomplete measure in the beginning of a line of music and you're going to, it's usually the last beat. So if you're in three, four, you're gonna count that as three and then come in on beat one right there. Today we covered a lot of rhythm patterns that you're going to see in your music all the time. And of course, there are many more to cover, such as dotted quarter eighth rhythms, 16th note combo rhythms, or three versus two polyrhythms, perhaps. Well, you're going to want to check out this lesson right here, which is going to catch you up on all of those because mastering rhythm is super important with mastering the instrument that you are trying to learn. It's been your piano teacher, Tim, here. Watch this lesson, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.